Dr. Raja Sabapathy is the chairman of the Department of Plastic Surgery, Hand and Microsurgery and Burns at the Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, India. He was trained in plastic surgery by Professor Venkataswamy at Chennai and underwent further training in hand and microsurgery at Stoke Mandeville and Cannesburn in the United Kingdom. He spent one year as a fellow at the Kleinert Institute in Louisville. In 1991, along with his brother, Dr. S. Raja Sekharan, himself an orthopedic spine surgeon, they converted the 16-bed hospital founded by his father into a specialty hospital for trauma, orthopedics, plastics, and microsurgery, now with 35 beds and four ORs, but further, it has grown to a 650 bed and 34 operating theater institution. They undertook many, many innovative steps to make this institution a success. High volume, high quality, and affordable cost were the chief factors in their work and the place is now called, and the system is now called, the Ganga model of care. Gradually, the unit attracted highly skilled individuals, and together they made it a preferred destination for teaching and for training. Over 2,000 surgeons from 70 countries have visited Ganga. Dr. Sabapathy remembers with gratitude the training and inspiration he obtained during his training in the United States and his relationship was further cemented by visiting senior surgeons from the United States. Following his visit, or following my visit rather, to Ganga as a Bunnell Fellow in 2007, over 50 of my residents, fellows, and medical students from our own institution, Washington University in St. Louis, have come to Ganga for microsurgery training. Recently, during the presidency of Dr. Neil Ford Jones, Ganga was selected as one of the centers for the International Traveling Microsurgery Fellowship of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. Raja has held the presidencies of the Indian Association, associations rather, in the fields of plastic surgery, hand surgery, microsurgery, and brachial plexus surgery, and is currently the president of the Asia Pacific Federation of Societies for Surgery of the Hand and secretary general of the International Federation of Societies for Surgery in the Hand. He has 140 publications and 47 book chapters to his credit. He has been awarded the Honorary Fellowship of the American College of Surgeons, the Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow, and has honorary membership in the British and South African Hand Societies and the Serbian Microsurgery Society. He is married to Nimi and has a son, Raja Shanmuga Kishnan, who is a plastic surgeon and part of the Ganga team, and a daughter, Gayathri, who lives and works in Chennai. Today, we're, we're so honored to have Dr. Sabapathy narrate the important life experiences that he has undergone to help build Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, a major city in the state of Tamil Nadu in the south of India. Starting from scratch in 1991, Ganga has evolved into a center that delivers accessible, affordable, quality hand surgery care to the masses, and in the process has become a destination for trainees from around the world. Dr. Sabapathy will share the life-changing moments with his mentors, and will discuss the events and ideas which brought together people who shared his common vision. The title of this oration is the popular quote attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, and incidentally, Today would have been Mahatma Gandhi's 151st birthday. Please join me in welcoming my idol, as Dr. Chang has stated in the previous seminar, uh, one of the all-time greats, uh, Dr. Raja Sabapathy, as our international guest speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have no disclosures in this talk. And uh, President uh, Dr. Boyer, members of the ASSH, and ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a great honor for me to deliver this uh, ASSH International Guest Lecture of uh, 2020. And I take this honor on behalf of all the hand surgeons of India. Our relationship with Dr. Boyer came over 18 years ago when both of us were a co-faculty in a British Hand Society course in Manchester. 
that friendship blossomed and he visited us as a Bunnell fellow in 2006. And he came to us when we were in a small hospital and at that time we were building the bigger one. He took a lot of keen interest to visit each and every part of the building that was being constructed. At the end of it he told me this, Raja, I'll do you three things. One, I'll establish great relationship between our units. Second, I'll help you to run a wrist open, wrist operative surgery workshop. And third, he said, when I become the president of the ASSH, India will be the guest nation. He made all three happen. And within three months, he sent an MOU, and more than 45 WashU fellows have come to our unit. I'm sorry if I'm missing some of the photographs. And in a few years' time, we also made a wrist operative surgery happen. That surgical course, which was done by uh, Richard Gilberman and Andy, Andy Weilen. I think it was a milestone in the history of wrist surgery in our country. And the third, and here we are as a guest nation, by which he has forged a great relationship between our societies and our nations. It only shows that he could, each person can make a difference, and that's the power of one. I strongly believe in the words which say, in the field of human history, Rarely have things been, big changes been brought by collective thought. It has always been brought by one person's thought, fired by passion, which brought about the change. And when he, uh, I took this topic along with Martin Boyer, incidentally, today, the 2nd of October, is the birthday of her father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi. And I'm so happy and proud that you have chosen that title one, as one of his words, which he said, you be the change that you want to see in the world. When we are preparing this topic and we are choosing the title, I asked Marty, what would you like to, what would you like me to speak on? He said, hi Raja, I have thought about this. It's a terrific opportunity to educate about India, Coimbatore, Ganga, you and your team, why you do what you do every day and how you do it. So here it is as to do what we do. And the changes that we made and paying tribute to all the people who helped us to make a change. So we come from a city called Coimbatore, it's a tied to city in South India. In 1991, when we started, we started in a small hospital, which was brought uh, by my father. And at that time, we had 35 beds with four operating rooms. And today, we are one of the largest centers for the two specialties of orthopedics and plastic surgery, with 600 beds and 32 operating rooms. And when we started in 91, the medical staff was three, my brother, myself, and a resident. And now we have a big family. And we also have become a center for teaching and training. And we are very proud and happy. And we consider it a great honor to have received more than 2,000 surgeons from 68 countries to our, to our center. But if you should ask me this question, do you think that you'll be able to do this? The honest answer is no. And looking back, I don't think we have done anything extraordinary. We just did a series of ordinary things at the right time with the right intentions. Harold Kleinert was once asked this about his creating Louisville, and his reply was, I didn't create this, it just grew, and I grew along with that. I think you know, we'll also be able to, we should also be saying the same type of answer. I think a lot of people helped us to grow, and I think it should start with our parents. The William, Dr. William Mayo, the senior of the two Mayo brothers, when asked about the growth, he is supposed to have said this. He said, the best thing Charlie and I ever did was to choose the parents that we had. I don't know whether we have the opportunity or the chance to do this, but then he has nicely put it. I think we could also say the same thing about our uh, parents. Justice Shuraj Patil, one of the former uh, judges of the Supreme Court of India, he said, parents are our first teachers and teachers are our second parents. We are very fortunate. I think we should thank God that we got great parents and great teachers. If we have to talk about a mother, I think I'll just only tell one thing. Uh, Abdul Kalam, the former president of India, he just uh, gave a famous quote. He said, having a small aim is a crime. I think my mother epitomizes those words. From the very beginning, when we were young, she asked us to aim high. And she, she said, whatever we aim, I think however we work hard, I'm sure and he said we'll be able to achieve this. And as far as my father, I thought I should say this. He was a symbol of integrity. I never see him do a thing which he knew was not right. 
It is easy to be good when things are good. But being good in the most trying circumstances is great. I think you know, that you was led by example. It is said that children may not do what you ask them to do, but then they always you know, keep seeing you. I think you know, we had the fair measure of seeing them both at their, at their trying times at the best of their times. And they also told us that you should have you no know, total belief in your mentors and practice it totally, not, not piecemeal. It is also taught to us that life is a package. You can't pick and choose. You must accept the whole and not pick what is comfortable to you, what is good to you, and then what you like, but you must do the whole thing. Then you will put in your full effort and you will be able to achieve success. Jokingly, my mother used to say that if we ask you to jump into a well, he said that you should jump, that's it. And then you're feeling fully confident that we should be able, that they will rescue you back. She also said that you should be really able, willing to, willing to and working hard to build such relationships. And that paid us very heavily because we believed in our mentors and did things correctly. When I was about to come from Louisville, I asked uh, Harold Kleinert and he said, if you want to start a big hand injury service, you should stay put in one place and be available all the time. And then these three A's are very famous, availability, affability, and ability, to which I added one, that is affordability. And being available was the key to success, and I was kind of really convinced of it. But then, so what we did was, we didn't uh, go to different hospitals. Though there are opportunities to do so, we stayed and put in one place in our hospital, though it was very small. But then what we really did was, every patient that came as an emergency, I saw them. Even if you had gone at uh, 10 o'clock home in the night, I think somebody, finger injury comes at midnight, came back and saw them. If they come at 4 a.m., saw them. I think everybody, I think irrespective of the time they arrived, saw them. I personally think that helped to build the image of the hospital and that helped to build, build up the center. It is very hard in the beginning when you're alone, but then that's the key to success. Then also we should say that the small is big because when we started, a lot of people said, you are a small hospital, how will big injuries come to your hospital? But then again, believe in client's words, you be available in the, all the time. I was personally convinced it's not the building, size of the building or the infrastructure that makes the difference. It's the skill levels and the attitude of the first person seeing the patient that makes the difference. So I think we are very convinced about that. I should give you by an example. See, here you see a five-year-old child comes on a Sunday evening, he run over by uh, lorry, and he, she arrives in deep shock, a hemoglobin of five grams. And you'll find that the x-ray shows there's no way he could uh, save the left limb and then such a big missing. Uh, we're very sure he's going to end up with a very high level of an amputation on the left side. And if you see the right side, it's extensively contaminated with no hopes of a salvage. And at the end of debridement, I think this was what we are left with, a yeah, high ebony amputation, almost close to the pelvis on the left side, and with uh, um, the threat of you know, having a very high baloney amputation. Even that, we need to have some flap tissues to do that. And if you really see, it would be extremely difficult for a child of this age to be rehabilitated with prosthesis. And then the idea strikes to the person that Harry was doing this, strikes it, that why not we uh, replant the left leg on the right side, and there we go. I think we had a cross leg replant. So at least you now one leg that has been achieved. Even the sites for skin rafts have been less, and then we did that, and then made the wound heal, and the bone also heal. And that's the same baby now after the cross leg replant. And here you find, when during the rehabilitation process, it's the replanted cross leg replant that side which powers the gate. I think with that now she is able to do. Now she has gone back to school and she is doing well in school. But then if you ask me what made this different, it was because a senior person who first saw the child could make the difference. And I'm very convinced that's what you now is very important in any trauma units. I am very, I'm also very concerned that if ever we will be able to get this by keeping the digital imaging, decisions based on digital imaging may never be the same. And when you are on site, I think the decisions will become very different. I think that's what you now we should always you now aim to achieve. At Ganga, we scored because the first person who sees the patient, who sees every patient, is a senior hand surgeon at the consultant level. Providing this level of care 24-7, 365, I think that's the challenge for any, any major unit. I also learned 
yeah, a few other things. One is that is you need to see them all. It's not a question of small things or big things. I think there are no minor surgeries, there are only minor surgeons. I was doing my plastic surgical training with Professor Venkat Samit in 1983 and 85 at Stanley Medical College. And Professor Venkat Samit built the busiest of the hand injury centers of the world. It is very significant, what he did was very significant because he achieved it in a public hospital where the service for free, free for all. And he had a great innovative idea to get the hand injury patients. What he did was, in, for a, such a busy hospital to get the patients to the hand injury service, he drew a big red line, a broad, flat red line from the, the doors of the hospital, across the corridors, across the steps, into the elevators, and then the red line with an arrow will go and land up in the area of the hand injury, hand injury ward. And then below that was written, all hand injury patients, please follow the red line. So the patients bypass the emergency room. So that is the biggest advantage. But then we got all the patients, but then the numbers go phenomenally. And we also had to see many small abrasions and minor injuries because everybody with anything in the hand followed the red line. So one of the days when I was on call, he was so busy, the next morning when I met him and was discussing about the patients, I told him, Sir, though it gets us more patients, we are dumped with some minor injuries which need not really come to us. It consumes so much of our time which we could spend on patients who deserve our care a lot better. So he was silent for a while and then he looked at me squarely in the eyes and told me, Rajasvadi, remember this, how you work depends upon the goals that you set for yourself. If we aim that we should not miss a yes, single digital nerve injury, that means you, know, you need to see all those small minor wounds in the fingers. I think that talk was a great elevation to me. That morning conversation, I should say, was an inflection point in my life. I learned that the standard of health care that we set is the standard we set at the entry level. Dr. Venkat Sami also taught me another thing about uh, working hard. One day, <clears throat> He called all of us and said that we need to work harder. It was very surprising to me because I thought that we are the most hardest working people in the whole hospital. So then everybody left, I just went up to him again and said, Sir, you told us that we need to work harder. And you know, sir, that we are the hardest working people in the hospital. Here again, there is a small silence and after that he said, so I never think you are working too hard. Unfortunately, you are surrounded by fellows who don't work. And he said, never compare yourself with others. The only person with whom you have to compete or compare is with yourself. And he said that every year you should be a better version of yourself. So with these thoughts, you know, with these backgrounds, we started to build the brand Ganga. I think we set on a good ground. We are set on a good fundamentals of seeing everybody and being available all the time. And now we need to scale up. For that, we took up the Aravind Eye Care uh, System. For those of you who do not know about Aravind, uh, Aravind Eye Care System is the biggest eye care system in the world. And they had also had humble beginnings of starting with 11 beds in the late 70s. And in the next 25 years, they grew to the biggest eye care system in the world. And currently, they do about 4.4 million outpatient examinations per year. And their group does more than 500,000 procedures a year with around 50% of them free. It is not just a service organization, they also advanced the science in 2018. They had about more than 100 peer-reviewed uh, publications. And their idea is to provide quality to the masses. When intraocular lenses came, Aravind realized that it's more important for the poor man to have it. The question was how to make the intraocular lens which cost at that time around $200, how to make it to the common man. Finally, they themselves manufactured it for less than $20. And this made revolutionize the IK. And now 30 million people see through oral lapse lenses. I took these slides from their own presentation. It is now used in over 130 countries. And what has started as a small hospital now has got a market share of 12% of the global market of intraocular lenses. They are a classic example of doing good and doing well. 
And what really was the secret of success, I think, because the founder, Dr. Venkat Swami, I think what he did was he articulated the purpose well. He said, preventing needless blindness. And he said, intelligence and capabilities are not enough. It's the attitude. And there must be a joy of doing something beautiful. What made Aravind win? If you really see what made Aravind win, because they had a very clear purpose of preventing needless blindness. And they said, we cannot turn anyone away. We cannot compromise on quality, and we must be self-reliant. So these rules meant that whatever Aravind chose to do, it has to do with these guidelines, with uncompromising compassion, excellence, and with its own resources. We just modeled our work on the model of uh, Aravind, the story of Ganga. We had a purpose that we had to prevent needless deformity due to hand injuries. We will be inclusive and will not turn anybody away. We will offer the best that is possible. We will be affordable by variable pricing, and we should offer the same quality of care 24-7, 365. And then that helped us to scale, and then volume is very important, as I would tell you in the later part of the talk. We took the same model as what Arvind did, high volume, high quality, affordable cost, because with volume, it increases our operational efficiency. I think if somebody should do a flap at four hours, then we could do it at three hours. So it decreases cost. So volume helps us to reduce cost and the complications. And we are able to provide quality at a cost which is unbeatable. So we will be remaining the leaders in the provision of care. And I need to talk about the variable pricing, which was our innovation. In our hospital, whenever comes to somebody with, comes with a major injury, nobody pays on arrival. Though we give them an idea as to how much it would uh, cost. And this pricing is according to their affordability. And this step won the game for us. And who decides how much the patient will pay? I think that's the question. I think what we did was, I think that's the most difficult thing to do. We decided that the first person who sees the patient will decide. And as the leadership, as the management, we transferred this financial power of decision to the surgeon on call. It greatly benefited the system and the patients. I think we just moved on. The next we talked about the power of collaboration. I think I should talk about the collaboration of the orthopedics department and the plastics department, the special relationship that we had with the anesthesia department. And you talk about the uh, evolution of the concept of on arrival block, which I think is a game changer in trauma care. In the very beginning, in the early 90s, we had very few doctors in our system. And I was always continuously operating from morning to night there are not doctors in the ground floor to receive the patients. So when the new injuries arrived, they think they were all sent to the operating room, and my anesthesiologist, Dr. Butt, received them. Uh, I should say the necessity drives innovation. We had a very small room. They were very small. It was only six feet by five feet, the two small rooms, and the pre-op patients, review patients, and the fresh injury patients were all there together. They were so crowded. And it's not a great scene, you know, it's not a, it's a, it's not a great scene. It is sometimes, you know, it is very confusing. And particularly if the dressings had to be opened in the case of major injuries, their noise, their shout, it made. So Dr. Butt thought, what if, if we could give a block and then open the dressings, a, a supracular brachial plexus block? It was done just to avoid the scream and the pain of the freshly arrived injured patients who are separated by others by a small partition. We found that it worked wonders. What really happened was, a patient who comes with pain about hundreds of miles away, he travels, and then he comes to the hospital, he comes to the theater, given a block, in about three to five minutes, he's totally rid of pain. It just helped us to increase the trust in the system. All of them were amazed. I think they thought it's a great, great hospital. So what we did was, there is, we made it as a system. All injuries, major injuries, were received in the ante room of the OR. And the first thing that was done as arrived was pain relief, was giving a block. It had you know, other benefits which we found at uh, because if there is a wound that is bleeding as you open, we could apply a tourniquet, I think it was painless. And then we could get you know, better radiographs. I think after a block, the dressings were taken and then we could place the hand in a nice position, separated, so that you know, we could get you know, classic pictures like this which otherwise, if it is in a bundled up thing, we, the, the, there'll be so much of overlap. That is, that was another advantage we found. For example, that's the X-ray which we had with the referral radiograph. And that's the radiograph taken of the same hand after we gave the block. I think it shows a great, great amount of difference. 
But the biggest point was this, I think which we really didn't anticipate. But after the block, what we did was we called the, one of the attenders or the family members or somebody who works with the office who came along with them and showed them what the injury was. I think they, nobody bothered to see the injuries in a painless environment. I think they were also extremely happy. We found that this was a great help because <clears throat> it helped us explain what we are trying to do for the patient, the need for multiple procedures, stage procedures, and uh, helped us to get compliance with physiotherapy later on. It was an amazing experience. Culturally, people thought it may not be acceptable elsewhere, but I'm very, very, very confident that this will be acceptable everywhere. It only needs that the patient has to be, has to be pain free. Necessity leads to innovation, but then you, know, you need to recognize it and we need a routine standard part of our care. I'm happy that as a surgeon, I coined the word honorable block. The only contraindication is that if you suspect an associated brachial plex injury, which you should not give it so that you shouldn't go for a total spinal. Next is that keeping the arrival to onto the table time as low as possible. I think this is very important when you take in major trauma. I think we need to have a number of operating rooms available, so we made a proportionately larger number of operating rooms when we built up our uh, hospitals. And in theater resuscitation was a great boon. I think there is great. So, for example, if you have a patient like this, a proximal to shoulder uh, avulsion amputation, a patient comes like this, and does the part in their being, usually it will be considered non replantable because it goes through the scapula. But then if you think, what's the other alternative? No? So I think we need to do that. So that's what no, we have done, the repl replantation. And if you see, there's a warm ischemia time, one hour, 10 minutes. And if you need to take it about no, four, no, four hours, we have finished the, finished the surgery. And we have done the radial and the ulnar nerves. The triceps has recovered. And you find that the ulnar, ulnar extensive flexors are getting are being rec recovered. And what we did was we transferred the triceps to biceps so that he is able to get elbow flexion. And now his uh, wrist extension has come and then the finger, uh, finger flexors are get. Siding of the index FDP to the index FDP of the other fingers. And transfer the dorsal sensory branch of the ulna nerve to the median nerve to get sensation. And now if you support, I think that's the sort of you know, finger flexion he gets. He just needs to have a wrist stabilization and a clock correction procedure. I'm sure he will use to land. But if you ask me what is that makes it possible at this in theater resuscitation, because we have not lost time in doing, doing this. I realize that beyond a level, skill levels won't do. Infrastructure and logistics are the, are the key. As Benjamin Rank said, compromise in organization is tantamount to accepting compromises in the standards of treatment. Now we come up to keeping the cost downs, and then we need to understand between trends and advances. A uh, trend is what is practiced at, one, at that point of time, but not necessarily is better for patient care. Advances are time-tested procedures which are definitely found to be useful. And every advance was a trend at one time, and time has proved to be that it is an advance. The role of the leader is to recognize trends which will become advances and take them on early. At Ganga, I should say that we practiced advances. I think we are not trendy. But then I didn't want to know, as really, I was not shy about it because we found that repetition is the mother of skill and we kept on to the following flaps as the workhorses and we refined our pedicle flaps to the hilt. This happened because of one lecture that I listened to Fu Chan Wei. You have to have the courage to practice what you believe. About 20, more than 25 years ago, I was listening to a talk by Professor Wei in an international meeting. He was presenting a toe pulp transfer for small finger defects. There were a lot of questions. At the end, he just said, in my hands, in my setup, for my patients, I find this the best. And after that, the whole discussion stopped. I thought there is a lot of meaning in that. I think you need to decide as to what is good for you, what you are capable, and what is good for your patients. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said, inflexible values, but then flexible methods. I think you should do that. So we need to say that you know, we are having certain points, that is radical deprivation and skeletal fixation on day one, whatever it matters and soft tissue cover as early as possible. It doesn't matter now what type of cover you give, but you need to cover. And if the end of debridement, you think it needs a flap, it gets the flap. We don't go to VAC. So volume plus quality gives you an opportunity to be a training center. I think we need to give back. I think I am very grateful for the United States and the UK for helping us. I think the best that America has done for the hand surgery worldwide is staffing the whole world with good hand surgeons. And I should also say that they transferred the American spirit at us. When people ask me what I gained during my stint at Louisville, I tell them the United States taught me two things. 
One, Louisville taught me how to deep I think that's fundamental. From that, now we took it on, took up everything. Second is that America gave me that can-do feeling, which is in this, I think it is, is priceless. And we had a good time. My wife, Nimi, tells me that the year in Louisville was the best period of her married life. On the flight back home, I thought, now we should create the Louisville of the East. And that's an aspirational goal, because an aspirational goal defies logic in many ways. Because you can't see a specific path to achieving the goal when you set it. You are not sure whether you reach it at all. But then you just know that's something now very, very important to you in your life. And the another aspirational goal I had was you know, setting up of an air ambulance service. It started with reading about the Mayos from the horse-drawn carriages to the Mayo One. I thought one day we should have it. And used to buy a lot of books on uh, uh, aviation. And it so happened that the, uh, India have hosted the Formula One. And as a part of the Formula One, they need to have uh, an air ambulance. I think that was a criteria. And then after the Formula One is not being used, so I thought that we should lease the aircraft. And then that was the Ganga Air Ambulance was born. And even I persuaded uh, the chief of Indian Air Force to inaugurate it. That's my daughter and myself inviting him. And we did inaugurate the uh, uh, Ganga Air Ambulance. And it had a lot of learning experience from the time that, you know, you shouldn't really uh, take off the grass around the area where the helicopter lands. That was the les first lesson we learned. And that was our inauguration of the uh, air ambulance as it is coming in. It was a very momentous occasion for us. I think it, it landed up. And uh, the whole country was uh, got to the news that Coimbatore gets the country's first hospital-based air ambulance. And how did we do? We did extraordinarily well. We created history. We transferred patients on a ventilator. We, I think we did so many firsts we did for our country. And, but then what happened is eight months into service, while it was getting established, then the problem stuck. The company didn't expect that it will fly so much. The more we flew, it strained them more, and they withdrew. Now the helipad waits, and then and now we are. So after eight lesson, the lesson that we learned was you need to have control over everything that you do. I think and having an hospital where which you are control, I think made it all possible. In this case, we didn't own the asset, so you can't work it the way we want. So sadly, we had to discontinue the services after eight months. But I'm not broken. Once Michael Tonkin told it on another occasion, he said, "Raja, in the end, all ends well. If it is not well, it's not the end." I think so we'll continue to nurture the dream of one day having the uh, Ganga One just as Mayo One. And taking on an idea which is beyond our capability has a very, very powerful side effect. It helps you find allies everywhere. And in our case, I think it is a family and the extended family of our, of our consultants. And everyone in our team making the same picture. Perhaps that's what you know, uh, impresses the visitors. And I always tell our visitors that are great quality control inspectors and we better to have all the time. And all the people visiting professors from the USA have contributed a great deal for our, for our growth. And in our library has got a huge section of Scott Levin's books. I need to finish off with a talk by Bob Ackland, how much he meant to me. I first met him as a trainee in Louisville, but that was only a passing memory. We became close at the time of uh, doing this, uh, republishing the book, this red book. I was struck by this obsession for perfection, okay? So one night, after we did that, he said, Bob, did you have a good night's sleep? I asked him the next morning. He said, probably no, because you are the cause. And he told me that <clears throat> just before you left, you told me that you didn't like one picture, so that no, I couldn't really sleep. I worked for four to five hours last night and made it all right. And when he was sick, he sent me this letter. Dear Raja, this is the original handwritten script of my 1983 instructional video, Rat Femoral Artery Anastomosis. I am sending it to you as a gift in recognition of our long friendship and your commitment to the educational tradition to which we belong. And he said, you need to take it as a hand baggage with you. I can't send it by courier and I do not want it to take the chance of a lost baggage. So when I came for an ASS in San Francisco, I crossed to the east and then took it as my hand baggage. And what it did contain? It had a sheaves and sheaves of papers. On one side, it was an action for video. On the other side, it was, an, it was a corresponding for the audio. And he said, never apologize for having high standards. People who really want to be in your life will raise up to meet them. 
I think people like them met those standards. I think I said, great for, I'm very grateful for spreading such ideas into our mind. I think we have a duty to do. I think as Mahatma Gandhi said, the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing is enough to solve most of the world's problems. And he said, if we do that, I think in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let each one of us be the change that you want to see in the world. I thank Dr. Boyer and the ASSH for this opportunity.